thank you for the kind introduction, the invitation to be here, and uh, good morning, everybody. Let's, yeah, that's the interactive part. Let's hear a good morning back in return, and we'll try and make this a little bit more interactive uh, during this talk. And again, if you'll have questions during this talk, feel free to ask me questions. I'm going to stay on one side so that this doesn't block your view of me and my view of you guys. The goal for today's talk, there are a number of uh, items that have been put into this title, um, but we're going to try and concise that in a 20-minute presentation. So focus on ICU delirium and try and make a case for you that ICU delirium is a manifestation of brain organ dysfunction. It's an organ dysfunction that we don't put a lot of attention to when we take care of patients in the ICU, but we probably need to and try and convince you all that that is the case, that it is a manifestation of brain organ dysfunction associated with its own outcomes, just like every other organ dysfunction is. I do have a disclosure. I have a research grant from Hospira, which has now been bought over by Pfizer. They mix dexmedetomidine in the US, and one of the studies that I'm going to present does have dexmedetomidine as one of its comparator arms. My salary support, et cetera, are through various research grants, including grants from the NIH. So let's start off with starting with the description of what is delirium. So delirium is a brain organ dysfunction, like I mentioned. It's a syndrome, and there are a couple of points to it. One is you have to have a patient arousable to voice to be able to assess a patient for delirium. If a patient is not arousable to voice, the patient is comatose, and you cannot assess for delirium while a patient is comatose. So if you're arousable to voice, then if you have acute mental status change, the pivotal feature based on the DSM-5 criteria, and it was also in the DSM-4 criteria, is that the patient needs to have inattention. Now, you may or may not have hallucinations, delusions, et cetera, as part and parcel of your delirium spectrum. They could be independent of delirium, or it could be part of the perceptual disturbances that patients have with delirium. You have an altered level of consciousness, and you have disorganized thinking. Patients are just not clearly thinking. So when you have a syndrome which has these constituent symptoms, that's when you call it delirium. But again, inattention is a pivotal feature of delirium. It's not the ability to just ask a simple question. The patient might answer a simple question, but does the patient manage to stay attentive to the next few questions? Or as soon as they answer that one question, do they then not have that level of arousal and it goes away? So that's sort of where the inattention component comes in beyond just a level of consciousness. Now, why should we care? We should care because it's one of the most prevalent organ dysfunctions. It's ubiquitous. That means it is seen in almost every patient population in our hospitals, starting from the immediate post-operative care unit, in your wards, in the ICU, where rates of delirium are 60 to 80 percent in mechanically ventilated patients. The rates of delirium are about 20 to 50 percent in your less severe ICU patients, those who are non-ventilated, et cetera. Cardiac ICUs. Rates of delirium somewhere in that 20 to 30 percent, looking at your cardiac, uh, surgical, as well as your cardiology ICU patients. And it does not spare our children either. The rates of delirium recently published now in the PICU are somewhere in the 20 to 50 percent range with lower rates of delirium in the older children and higher rates of delirium in some of the younger children, <clears throat> especially because many of them are also associated with cardiac surgery. So one of the most prevalent organ dysfunctions in the ICU, and therefore, if there is an organ dysfunction that is so prevalent, is it fair that we actually don't assess for this in our patient population? And what can it tell us? So the response is not that if you find somebody with delirium, that you have to immediately reach out for an antipsychotic and try and treat the patient with an antipsychotic medication like haloperidol or any of the other atypical antipsychotics. The goal is to use delirium as a marker of brain dysfunction and try and look at what potentially could be causing this delirium in our patients. It's the same way as we use the urinary output creatinine. We use that as a marker, then we try and find out why is it that the patient has low urinary output or why is it that the patient's creatinine is going up. We don't immediately start dialysis or Lasix or whatever the treatment modalities we finally choose, but we start looking for the underlying cause. Similarly, when a patient has a low PF ratio or a low mean arterial pressure, we try and look, is this a cardiogenic component, is it a vasodilatory component, et cetera. We start looking for the diagnosis. Similarly with delirium, it's a syndrome that tells us there is something wrong with the brain being the manifesting organ, and let's try and look for the underlying cause 
for why this patient is showing these manifestations. So use that as a marker of brain dysfunction, not just a knee-jerk reaction that once you have a patient with delirium, you have to just do X. Now, just like any other organ dysfunction, it's associated with worse outcomes. So similarly, if you had a patient with kidney failure or acute kidney failure, depending on the severity, depending on how long the patients have renal dysfunction, the probability of worse outcomes increase. Similarly with delirium, the presence or absence of delirium as well as the duration of delirium is associated with worse outcomes. Significantly higher costs for care for patients in the ICU. It's associated with longer hospital stays, higher risk of death, and prolonged cognitive and psychological dysfunction. Now these are all association studies. We have not yet proven causality. What we know is that delirium, if your patient has delirium in the ICU, it's associated with worse outcomes. And some of the underlying principles that go into that risk for delirium perhaps also contribute to these worse outcomes. But it at least tells you this patient is vulnerable and potentially is going to have worse outcomes because you have started seeing delirium in this patient. There are studies which have looked at the duration of delirium and mortality. And this is one study by Margaret Pisani. And on the y-axis over here, you have survival probability. And what these Kaplan-Meier curves are showing is zero days of delirium, survival probability is really high. As your days of delirium increase, one to two days, three to five days, five to nine days, your probability of survival goes down. Again, these are association studies, not causality studies, but it gives you a hint that delirium is not just an innocent bystander of ICU care, but it's telling you that something is wrong with your patient, pay attention to it, because otherwise this patient is going to have bad outcomes. We have been interested in the long-term cognitive impairment seen in patients after they survive a critical illness, and about 30 to 50% of patients have pretty significant cognitive impairment that prevents them from getting back to their daily quality of life, prevents them from going back to work, etc. And one of the strongest, potentially modifiable risk factors we found in this study was delirium. What is protective is education, complexity of occupation, your socioeconomic status, etc. might be protective, but as one thing that is potentially modifiable, it was delirium, okay? So at least there is hints over there which show that delirium is a marker, is associated with worse outcomes. And if you can focus on delirium, you may be able to improve some of these outcomes in our patients. So therefore, to try and make some interventions to try and improve outcomes in our patients, we need to understand the risk factors for delirium. Now, there have been a number of studies, and you can see from some of the references over here, which have looked at the risk factors for delirium. Majority of the risk factors that are seen on the left side over here are non-modifiable. You can't choose the age of the patient that you have in your ICU. You can't say, well, if you have prior cognitive impairment or dementia, admission to our ICU is closed for the day. You have no such choices, right? Potentially modifiable risk factors are shown over here on the right-hand side. The psychoactive medications that we frequently give our patients because we feel that there is a need that these patients are sedated. When we have now data which supports that patients who are interactive in the ICU actually have better outcomes. In the past, we were really careful about wanting any memory of the ICU stay to be erased, thinking that's such a terrible time in a patient's life, why should they remember anything? We now know that that wasn't the right thing for our patients but psychoactive medications therefore play a role even in delirium, and I'll show you all some data on that. And then sleep deprivation. Work in sleep deprivation and interventions to improve sleep is really in its infancy, but at least sleep deprivation has been shown to be having a bi-directional relationship with delirium. Patients with delirium tend to sleep less. If you sleep less, you tend to have more delirium. Which comes first is difficult to say, but there's a bi-directional association between delirium and sleep disturbances. This is some work we did very, very early on in the 2000s, looking at benzodiazepine exposure and the risk for delirium the next day, looking at a temporal association of the cognitive status on time point one, exposure to risk factors, and then cognitive status on time point two. And what we found was that increasing doses of benzodiazepines in the previous 24 hours put you at a much higher risk for delirium the next day. By the time you got to about 20 milligrams of lorazepam in a 24-hour period, so that would mean a drip of a milligram an hour, your probability of delirium the next day was almost 100%. If you translate that into midazolam equivalents, and we've done studies now with midazolam, if you are about 2.5 milligrams of midazolam 
a given hour, your probability of delirium the next day is 100%. So 2.5 milligrams an hour over 24 hours is about 50 milligrams. Probability of delirium the next day is almost 100%. Now with bolus dosing, with reduction in benzodiazepine exposure, whether those associations are still going to be strong, et cetera, is not known. But at least when we've studied this, there's been a strong association between these medications and delirium the next day. So that brings us to what can we do in the last sort of five to seven minutes of this talk. There are two guidelines that have come out, or the, um, there have been numerous guidelines from different societies, but the SCCM put out the PAD guidelines, so it's the pain, agitation and delirium guidelines, and they call the PAD guidelines, and they focused on the symptoms that patients have, right? They don't have, it's not called the sedation, agitation, and delirium guidelines because then they would be called the SAD guidelines, and who would want to have a SAD guideline? So PAD guidelines is pain, agitation, and delirium guidelines, and what the Society of Critical Care Medicine then did was try to use a framework to try and incorporate PAD guidelines into clinical practice, and that's the focus of the ICU liberation an animation campaign. And what they have focused on is five elements, the A, B, C, D, E, F bundle, sorry, six elements now. It used to be the A, B, C, D, E. Now it's the A, B, C, D, E, F, and I hope it just stops at F and we don't go on to G, H, et cetera, because that's gonna be difficult to remember. So it starts with assessing and treating pain, doing both awakening and treating breathing trials, coordinating these awakening and breathing trials so that they're not done in isolation, thinking about the choice of sedation, when you need sedation, delirium management, exercise and early mobility, and then family involvement. And I'm just gonna spend a minute or two on each of these to try and explain the background behind the ABCDF bundle. If you look at this bundle together, there have been about 20 to 30 JAMA New England Journal articles, Lancet articles, which have supported this bundle. Not studied as a bundle together, but as individual elements. And recent data now suggests that using the bundle is associated with improved mortality, at least in this study that came out from Kaiser Permanente in California in about 6,000 patients. So what's the A stand for? It's assessing and managing pain. And just as a quick um, show of hands over here, how many people over here use a monitoring instrument for pain in your mechanically ventilated patients? So a small proportion. Thank you. So the two tools that have been validated for use in mechanically ventilated patients, at least per the SCCM guidelines with good psychometric properties, is the BPS scale, the behavioral pain scale, and the CPOT scale. So whichever one you use, it's fine, but using a pain scale has been shown to be independently associated with improved outcomes in patients. Now, whether it is because you're monitoring for pain, therefore treating appropriately for pain and not sedating a patient who actually is in pain, or whether it's a reflection of a good ICU with good ICU practices, that's not clear. But using a pain scale, at least in the study by Pan et al., showed that you had improved outcomes in the ICU. Study coming out from Scandinavia, so this is the Thomas Strom study from Denmark, looking at a protocol which focused on analgesia first approach. So instead of just putting every patient on a sedative and analgesic, the focus was in the intervention group to have just analgesia first, and only in the few patients that required sedation would they actually give sedation. So they would give PRN morphine, Haldol for delirium, and then propofol infusion if the patient was still uncomfortable or had patient ventilator dyssynchrony. In the control group, they just had sedation with propofol, PR, and morphine. And what they showed was by using a focused approach of doing pain first, they could actually get the patients out of the ICU much faster. So an analgesia-based approach with improved outcomes. Only a small proportion of patients in the group that was in the analgesia-only group got propofol, which means that every patient in your ICU on mechanical ventilation does not need to be sedated. They can be managed with just analgesics, and if they're comfortable on an analgesic, why should you then need to use a sedative if it's been associated with worse outcomes? Awakening and breathing trials, so Crest did the daily awakening trials, showing getting people off the mechanical ventilator faster. The ABC study combined an awakening trial with a breathing trial, so two-stepped approach, you did a spontaneous awakening trial. When your patient was awake, you did a spontaneous breathing trial. And this means assessing a patient for a daily awakening trial and a breathing trial every single day. Not when they get better, but right from day one 
doing an awakening and breathing trial. How many of you over here have protocols in your ICU which mandate daily awakening and breathing trials and screening for it? All right, a good number of them. So those of you who don't in your ICUs, at least think about it because doing daily awakening and breathing trials has been shown to get people off ventilator much faster. So it adds to just the daily awakening trials by adding the breathing trials coming off the ventilator much faster. Re unfortunately, no change in the duration of delirium, but the amount of patients with coma was significantly reduced by having daily awakening and breathing trials. The other amazing thing on the ABC study was actually modifying sedation paradigms resulted in a mortality benefit, a 32% lower risk of dying. So if those of you who believe that sedation is associated with increased mortality, and there's work by Yaya Shahabi from Australia which has shown this association between deep sedation and mortality, then doing a daily awakening trial and reducing sedative exposure and improving mortality at least fits into that picture of sedation-associated mortality. C is choice of sedation. Again, I say after analgesia because once you have your patient comfortable on an analgesic, you may or may not need a sedative. But in a small proportion of patients, you may need a sedative, and then what do you choose? The PAD guidelines have recommended using a non-benzodiazepine agent as your first drug of choice. So in 2003, the guidelines recommended lorazepam as first drug of choice. In 2013, they said non-benzo as the first drug of choice. So big paradigm shift in sedation in the ICU. And this was based on a couple of studies. This is a study by Shannon Carson that compared lorazepam, intermittent boluses, to propofol infusion. And what they found was that if you were on propofol, your ventilator days were shorter, whether you survived or you did not. Overall, ventilator days were shorter, and ICU length of the, um, stay was shorter in the patients that had um, propofol as compared to that came out wrong whether you survived or not. But uh, it meant what I meant was in all patients and then only in survivors, ventilator days were shorter in, the group, in both the groups. We have interest in the alpha-2 agonist, dexmedetomidine, and given that we had shown earlier studies which showed benzodiazepines were associated with worse outcomes, we've studied dexmedetomidine. So this is the men's study which did dexmedetomidine versus lorazepam. And what we showed was on day one, both groups had about 60% delirium. Over the days, the patients in the lorazepam group shown in gray, greater proportion of patients with delirium, lower proportions of patients with dexmedetomidine on delirium. Whether this is because dexmedetomidine has certain properties to reduce delirium, or whether you just prevented a patient from being on lorazepam, which increases probability of delirium, one can't answer, but at least changing sedation paradigm seems to improve outcomes. The SETCOM study compared uh, dexmedetomidine to midazolam. Again, very, very similar graph than what I showed you earlier on. 60% rates of delirium on start goes up in the midazolam group, comes down nicely in the dexmedetomidine group. So at least something to think about that alpha-2 agonists might help with improving patient outcomes. Also, faster extubation in patients on dexmedetomidine. Delirium assessment and management. How many of you use a delirium monitoring tool in your ICU? Either sizable number. So, good, excellent. So the CAM ICU and the ICDSE are two validated instruments that have good psychometric properties for assessing delirium in the ICU. Whichever one you use, that's fine. Without monitoring delirium, 70% of it would get missed. So therefore, monitoring for delirium is really important. What do you do once you monitor for delirium? The important thing is to try and look for the underlying cause that might be leading to delirium. Similarly, like we have with ARDS, you try and figure out what is it that you, leads potentially to that ARDS and try and find the underlying cause. If you have dangerous agitation, you might want to start thinking about antipsychotic medication just for controlling the agitation. Not sure it actually treats delirium. In the few studies we have, this is the MIND study comparing haloperidol to ziprazidone to placebo. You can see that the resolution of delirium and coma were exactly the same, whichever group you were in. The HOPE ICU study done by Valerie Page from the UK, comparing haloperidol to placebo, no difference in outcomes. We've just finished the MIND ICU study, which is about a 600 patient study looking at antipsychotic medications in the ICU. And we enrolled our last patient last week, so hopefully we'll have the results in the coming years.
And then the last part, well, two parts, uh, e-early mobility. This is a study done by Schweikart where they did an early physical therapy in patients in the ICU. And what they showed was that by having early physical therapy, you had more patients functionally independent at discharge, but you also reduced delirium by half, whether it was duration of delirium or time in the ICU. The important thing to realize, and the earlier speaker also alluded to this, that in the ICU studies, there have been follow-up studies by Moss, there have been a study that came out of Germany by Shaler. Some of these studies have not shown a benefit, and every time when you compare when the intervention started, the Schweikart study started the intervention in day one and a half, the Shaler study started the intervention on day two, both of those were associated with improved outcomes. The Moss study started the intervention on day eight, not associated with improved outcomes. So early intervention is what is key in all these cases. And then the last part is F. It's the involvement of the family in the care of the patients to empower the family to be able to question things that are being done because ultimately the family does know what the patient wants. And what the patient wants is to survive that critical illness and get back to their families, getting back to their hobbies and getting back to their work. And that is really our challenge as physicians now to move the paradigm from survival to survivorship, where they're able to enjoy the quality of life that they were previously enjoying. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. There, have, there is one question from the audience uh, that is asking, what is your favorite medication against sleeping problems in an intensive care unit in order to prevent delirium? So I don't think there is any magic drug because there's no data to support it. There are studies which have now shown the use of Romeltion, uh, but it really hasn't looked at sleep in that much detail. So I don't have a magic drug. What we try and do is make sure that our patients are awake during the day. We try and keep them lightly sedated if necessary. We ambulate them as much as possible, get them tired during the day. And I think that's the magic drug. You get them well worked out during the day so that they actually sleep at night. When I have patients who stay awake all night and the next day, the bedside nurses or the families or whoever turns the lights off and say, okay, they didn't sleep last night, so I'm gonna let them sleep during the day. I have a detailed discussion with the family and the nurses and say, I know you think I'm torturing your loved one, but I have to change the cycle. I have to get them back awake during the day. So yes, they can have their one hour nap if you want them to have a nap, but they're going to be awake during the day. They're gonna complain, et cetera. And so I think um, at this moment, that's what I would suggest. There are people who try uh, quetiapine, which is Seroquel, has become a common drug. Why? There's no data supporting it. So antipsychotic medications for sleep has become commonly used in the US. I don't think there's any data supporting it. Um, I'm not a big fan of melatonin yet. I, don't, I have not seen big data on it. Um, so that's my answer. Get them working out so that they get tired. And there is a follow-up question to this. How do you measure sleep? And uh, <laughs> do you assess this and continuously on these patients to have a perception on how much they sleep? So there seems to be a quite a varying degree of uh, disconnect between what the bedside nurses and the teams taking care of the patients think they're sleeping versus what you actually see on EEG versus potentially what patients respond to on something like the Richard Campbell pain scale. So in the studies we've done, we've done 24-hour polysomnography, and what that has shown is that during 99% of the time, the sleep, when measured by a sleep physician, cannot categorize it into any of the normal stages of sleep, and it's classified as atypical sleep in 99% of the time. And even in those times when you have normal sleep, there are numerous microarousal, et cetera. There are data suggesting that dexmedetomidine might mimic non-REM sleep, but these are studies done in normal human volunteers, not in the context of critical illness, with sepsis, with alarms going on in the background, et cetera. Also, normal sleep is not just non-REM sleep, it's REM and non-REM cycling, and I'm not sure we actually have any medication that does that. So we do not monitor routinely for sleep in our ICUs. Um, I mean, the best is, asking patients who are able to respond, saying, did you feel rested at night? But I think that's all we have. We don't do any routine sleep monitoring in our ICs. 
despite all the beautiful bundles, we still see a lot of delirium in the ICU. And we discharge a lot of patients to the ward with delirium. And they have a high risk of readmittance to the intensive care. It's hard to get adherence to protocols in the ICU. It's impossible to get it in the hospital, is our experience. So we have one ward in the hospital that's really good with delirium, and that's a geriatric ward. We send lots of delirious patients, also the not very old patients, to the geriatric ward. What is your experience with that? So we have really tried hard to educate our ward <laughs> about delirium and so we had the same problem as you have and we still have the same problem but it's improving where the ability to monitor for delirium on the floors has now become mandatory and at least some education about that has become mandatory. So all our bedside nurses now as part of their orientation when they start delirium module has become mandatory and it's part of every year's competency assessments for our residents, bedside nurses we should be doing it for the faculty, but we don't. Um, do the competency assessments for delirium assessment and at least some non-pharmacological management and a couple of steps from a delirium protocol. So I think we have the same problem. It's not equivalent in the ICU and other <coughs> wards, but there has been a lot of focus. Uh, we don't specifically send people to a geriatric ward because just um, our pressures for moving patients out of the ICU are so high that often we don't end up just having the ability to send them to one particular ward. But I think training your um, support staff is probably the best option. Can I, uh, any more questions from the floor? There's one back there. Keep going straight to the Sorry. left. Sorry. <laughs> I wonder, uh, we have um, a lot of patients and we try to protect them from noise, especially during night. Uh, sometimes you don't succeed, but I also think maybe noise is a part of daily routine and that will keep them uh, sane some of the time. What is your perspective with noise for intensive care unit patients? It's terrible. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so at least there's enough data saying that we are noisy in our ICUs, whether it's during the day or at night, we are extremely noisy. Um, the problem is that the compensation for a noisy ICU is that we increase the levels of the alarm so that we can hear the alarms over the noise that we are already making. We are trying some protocols right now where during night, we have X amount of hours at night where we move the alarms outside the patient's rooms and we dim the lights, we have these quiet times, we're not allowed to go into a patient's room unless, of course, they're cr critically ill and requiring every hour changes of their pressors, et cetera. So that's one goal. I have another uh, colleague of mine who's actually shown some really good data showing that reducing the volume of alarms in a noisy environment actually still allows, still allows clinicians, and this is a group of anesthesiologists, to actually pay attention to important alarms. And the next part in the study is to try and see whether modifying alarms to reduce the noise actually will help, help decrease delirium and PTSD associated with ICU stay. But yeah, I think we all need to do a really good job trying to reduce and reminding people you know, at night to turn off the lights, turn off the volume. During the day, yep, keep the lights on. You can be a little bit more um, noisy, I guess, during the day. Not too much, but a little bit more. So good point. Thank you. One I final have, question. I have a last question for you. Okay. Challenging a bit the, the wake up call concept. You cited Chris and Girard lovely studies, but some time ago. And uh, I come to think of um, Sangeeta Mehta's study where she showed that titration, uh, comparing propofol and, and benzodiazepines, uh, rendered the same uh, time in the ventilator and the same possibility of extubation. But my question to you is whether wake-up calls might increase delirium, taking the patient from a deep sleep to being awake and alarmed or whether titration would be more soft to the delirium thing? So with regards to the daily wake-up trials, we did not see any decrease in delirium, but we did not see any increase in delirium. What we did see was a decrease in coma. And so obviously, if you have a patient who is no longer comatose, there's a probability of them being delirious or normal, but then you have to choose whether you'd prefer to be comatose 
versus then delirium and normal. And so that's sort of where it is. It's, it's a spectrum. And I would say that perhaps as a first step, let's get them out of coma and then at least figure out what they have. Because when you're comatose, you don't even know what the underlying pathology is. And at least get them to either a normal or a state so that we can then at least interact. The study by uh, Sangeeta Mehta, so the sleep study was a study which looked at routine protocols, a nurse-driven protocol versus a daily awakening trial. And what they showed was there was no difference in outcomes, unlike the CREST study, as well as the Girard study. What's striking in the daily awakening trial study that was done by uh, Geeta Mehta was that the amount of midazolam in the groups, in both groups, was humongous. 70 to 80 milligrams of midazolam in a 24-hour period in both the control and the intervention arm. Actually, the intervention arm had about 100 milligrams of midazolam in a 24-hour period. So there was actually no difference in the groups with the amount of sedation exposure. So the bottom line is if your protocol does not permit any reduction of sedation use, perhaps you're not going to see the outcome. At least from anecdotal experiences, we've heard that people were getting benzodiazepine exposure just before the daily wake-up trial. So to prevent patients from actually getting agitated for the wake-up trial, infusions were shut off, but benzodiazepine boluses were given just before. There was no experiment done, at least, and that's my bias. Um, but unless you change the sedative exposure, that's sort of where the key is. Just doing a daily wake-up trial, if you don't actually change any of the exposure, it's not going to make a difference. Thank you. Now, a very quick yeah, last very question. <laughs> but you can continue to ask questions on the app, and we, if we have time in the end, we may... Christian Madsen it. from uh, Odense. Um, I would like to ask you, now you are examining dexmedetomidin and comparing to lorazepam, which you have previously shown is uh, detrimental. Why don't you compare it to placebo? Isn't that how you should compare a new drug if it introduced compared to placebo instead of comparing to another harmful drug? So let me rephrase. The study that I showed you, the um, lorazepam study, was done in 2007. So the first part was showing benzodiazepines are potentially harmful. The next step was to show, well, if it's potentially harmful, what is the alternative? So we studied dexmedetomidine versus lorazepam, showing that by changing sedation paradigms, outcomes were improved. That was done in 2007. There's no present study comparing lorazepam to dexmedetomidine because, as you said, there's enough data now to say that it's potentially harmful. I cannot randomize a patient to a lorazepam arm group. We use lorazepam in less than 1% of our patients in our ICU. So the present study that's being done is actually a comparator of dexmedetomidine to propofol because those are the two agents that we use commonly. I'd love to use, do a dexmedetomidine versus placebo study, but at this present time, I think there's not enough equipoise, at least for our institutional review board, where we can say that it's okay not to give sedatives to one group of patients. Our institutional review boards are still a little iffy on this concept of one group, you allow sedation, and one group absolutely don't allow sedation, but use a placebo. Hopefully, in next... Uh, few years, uh, that should be the case. Thank you very much. Big hand for...